We're good to go. Okay, we left off yesterday. Here's exactly where we left off. I know a lot of you were not in class yesterday for whatever reasons. But we're hitting upon the Louisiana Purchase. And the way we phrased it in class yesterday was that, above all, an incredible amount of land acquired by the United States at a very young time in its country's history. And also, we framed it as a question about Thomas Jefferson's what? How do we frame the Louisiana Purchase yesterday in terms of Jefferson's presidency? So like his disavowing to his beliefs. Yeah, so what Christian said was basically disavowing his beliefs in how he interpreted the Constitution. Jefferson had fundamentally been a Democrat Republican, meaning he put the strict interpretation of the Constitution as a priority. But as president, self-preservation of the nation was most paramount. And we linked it to Jefferson's ardent belief that the best United States, the, the best economy of the United States was one dominated by what? Agriculture. Agriculture. So with all this mass land grab, 828,000 acres of land, Jefferson was on his way to helping fulfill the United States' agrarian society that he, he so believed in. But, obviously, with all this territory now, the question is, what's out there? What's out there? And that's going to lead to the infamous uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, which I'm going to give you a couple key facts about. Yes? Um, 15 million divided by 828,000 is $18. I don't know. It's, it, it doesn't I think it's, it, it's this. It's like 500 million. Would that be more? Yeah. That would be yeah. more divided yeah. by the same yeah. amount, so it would be more. It's more. It's more. It's more. It's more. No, because the, art, the article... It says $18 an acre. But the article said oh, $0.04, yeah. Cents, right? Yeah. yeah. But... Uh, so I guess... One of them... I think one of $828 million. Uh, no, no, $8,280,000. Probably. All right. Well, either way, I went out there on YouTube. My slide sucks. Shout out to my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, the article made note of four cents an acre, so let's just go with that. Let's just go with that. I, I may have gotten a little bit fuzzy math here, but it was 828,000 acres, so I probably just made a boo boo. Forgive me. Boo boo. Now, the Lewis and Clark expedition, you, you may know vaguely about it. a couple key points about it. I, really, we're not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but I want to reinforce a couple key, key issues. First of all, William Clark was a personal uh, secretary for Jefferson. So Jefferson had, had asked Clark to go on this journey. Meriwether Lewis was a scientist, so he went as sort of a, a, an expert uh, to jot down and journal along the journey um, that really was, uh, in terms of scope and ambition, think about how no American citizen had really come as far as the Pacific Ocean in terms of being able to bring back knowledge and spread it and diffuse it to the masses. If, you, if Jefferson and the country was trying to shift its way into an agricultural-based economy, knowing what was in this territory newly acquired was key. Now, obviously, we know today that there, what, what was in that territory, which was that it was littered with different tribes of Native Americans. And that, that we know from going back to the very first article you guys read at the beginning of the year, that the Pacific Northwest Native American tribes and the Great Plains tribes had thriving societies. But no Americans had really come into direct contact with them. Unless, of course, they were Western fur traders or living on the far fringes of society in the Northwest Territory. But crossing the Mississippi and going off into this new territory was really a daunting task. And all, to, all told, um, this is kind of interesting, the journey would, would be about an 8,000-mile trek 
8,000 miles. And Congress gave the expedition group, which is a small group actually, very small group, only 2,500 bucks back then. Which I, I did find an inflation calculator. It's, it's roughly 40 grand today. So not a lot of money. Not a lot of money. But the journey was a personal, personal issue for Jefferson. He wanted one of his own guys to go and lead this expedition. And William Clark was a former soldier, former soldier, and that's who Jefferson trusted with this mission. Most of the recorded information comes from uh, Lewis's diaries, a lot of information from his diaries. And what historians kind of call this the group, they were called, they're known as the core of discovery. And you know, these are made up of, of, of you know, sort of ex-soldiers, adventurers, traders, you know, people who, who knew the land. But inevitably, the story of Lewis and Clark like, cannot be told, of course, without discussing Native Americans. And I believe I asked the team trivia question about this before the break. You know, there were a few tribes that Lewis and Clark leaned heavily on, one in particular that without their assistance and their knowledge of the terrain would have made the journey for the Corps of Discovery very difficult. Does anybody recall what tribe greatly assisted the Corps of Discovery? It was in the reading you guys did before even break. The Mandan, the Mandan tribe, correct, correct. The Mandan tribe proved to be extremely valuable assets, and they often um, you know, worked cohesively with Lewis and Clark in a way. Yeah, yeah, on this picture. Steel of Justin. Sure. You bring your stuff in. Clark. So Lewis and Clark worked cohesively with some tribes. In fact, have you guys ever heard of, um, it's kind of like the, um, oh, what's the guy? Why am I drawing up this one? Blank. The Mayflower, the interpreter that we debated. Why am I trying to Swanto. Swanto, right, duh. I mean, do you know that one of the Mandon uh, translators that, that helped? You heard the name? Was it Sacagawea? Sacagawea, yeah, yeah. So some of the Native Americans proved to be valuable assets along this journey. And Sacagawea, and there was another uh, translator that the Mandan tribe um, had afforded to the journey to help out uh, the explorers. But not all native tribes, not all native tribes were obviously as welcoming to this expedition of white settlers. And think about the pattern we've discussed throughout the course of this year. Every push west, whether starting from the original settlers in Virginia, the New England settlers, every time White settlers pushed west. The consequences for Native Americans tended to be what? In almost all cases we've studied this year, even now with the Spanish, moving into the Native American tribes down there. Adam? Sorry? Well, in a lot of cases, they were forced to eventually relocate. You know, tribes, the dynamics, they were, there was forced migration, perhaps, because of diseases. Sachin? Uh, exploitation of their resources and ultimately. Exploitation of resources, the land, certainly. Ultimate death, yeah. I mean, look, the patterns, I told you, the history doesn't repeat itself, it's the patterns that do. So this could spell, and we're not quite there, because this was just a small band of, of explorers, a small band of explorers. But, remember, the United States was coming to eventually claim this territory. And think back to that quote I gave yesterday. Remember what Jefferson said about the treaty? That, that brought in the Louisiana Purchase, it could be a means for Native Americans on the east to move west, clearing more space, more land for farming and plantations. But the writing was on the wall here, and that's you know, ultimately one of the motivators. Let's not be so naive to think that, that the noblest of intentions here existed. Part of the reason for this expedition was to figure out, hey, where were there certain tribes? Is this land hospitable? Could the United States foster alliances? Two of the groups that proved to be hostile, and there were skirmishes that Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery would, would have to deal with. The Sioux tribe in particular, who were one of the dominant groups on the Great Plains, a very nomadic tribe, uh, proved to be quite hostile in protecting their land. 
as long, along with the Blackfoot Native tribe as well. Lewis and Clark engaged in conflicts with both those tribes. So I guess, you know, to tie in the Louisiana Purchase to a theme we've talked about so much already, the hostilities that would exist between Native Americans and white settlers will continue to develop throughout the 19th century. But by the end of the 19th century, this conflict is no longer going to be. Because by then, the United States would have, would have conquered the entire continental United States. So we're merely setting in motion a greater explosion of native conflicts within the United States. And you can see, I mean, again, you, you've got the different tribes. These are the different tribe locations. I should have pointed that, er that out earlier, sorry. But the journey did last three years. Three years, there and back, three years. And the information was invaluable. The information was invaluable. And it would certainly spell future development, but not quite yet. The, the, the gist of the United States remained in the Northwest Territory and east of the Mississippi. It wouldn't be till later when what evolved and what developed when the United States really started to, to pump itself towards the West. Deshaun? Trains? Railroads. Right. Railroads are going to be the great vehicle that open up the West. And not just railroads, but also you know, the Oregon Trail and some of the other famous uh, trails that existed during, during the California Gold Rush. Uh, but trains are going to be what opens up the West in the, in the later half of the century. But we're not there yet. We don't have that technology. It's not, it's not around. I'm just kind of setting you up for, for what's, what's happening later. Yes, sir? Ooh, you know, I, was there a way? Sure. But did they actually send correspondents back on the trip? That I don't frankly know. They would have had to send to a, cur a courier, uh, somebody to, to deliver a message, because there was no telegraph system yet. The telegraph wasn't invented uh, yet until the 1830s and 40s did that become available. So the only way they would have been able to get messages back would be people to, to backtrack. So I, I, I don't know precisely if they did they use that system, but that's why they relied on the journals. Lily, the instigator. We now know. They're so docile when you're not around. Now you join the Bermuda Triangle, and here we go. Raucous behavior in the corner. Or maybe it was your absence yesterday. I don't know. I don't even know what happened. It's just... Oh. All right. So keep Lewis and Clark on the back burner as a way for you guys to, um, and everyone watching at home obviously, like link a direct example, a direct consequence of the Louisiana Purchase. But Jefferson's issues you know, domestically, remember we talked about the transition from Federalist to Dem Rep, and he dealt with the judges and the fiasco at Marbury versus Madison, reversing many of the policies of the Alien Sedition Acts. And domestically, perhaps one of Jefferson's greatest achievements, though, was orchestrating the purchase of Louisiana territory. But how about foreign affairs? Where did Jefferson get, get the United States involved directly in foreign affairs? Maybe one of the most un unknown, underrated early bits of American history. Where did Jefferson and the United States get directly involved around the globe in this era? Abdul. North Africa, yes, North Africa. For the first time in American history, American military forces would enter into the Eastern Hemisphere. Obviously today, the United States' presence in the Middle East, Arabia, and North Africa has been well documented. Our military's been there now for the last, however long the, the Iraq war has been going on, and even before then, we had a military presence in North Africa going back to World War II and World War I. So this is the first time in America's history that troops would be dispatched to go across the Atlantic into what we can consider today North Africa. 
But at the time, these North African states that included Morocco, Algeria, Libya, they were known as, as a collective group of states. You ever recall from the reading what the states were referred to as? They were part of the Ottoman Empire, but they had a separate name because they kind of operated a little bit independently of the Ottoman Empire. I'm calling someone randomly here. This was in the packet that I, I should have been in the packet that I gave you guys the other day. Christopher? <coughs> you remember? Regina? We camera shy here? Always. I don't, come on, I do already got us a good, good head start. <coughs> it, was in, it was in the reading, right? Yeah. The reading you were supposed to do after the test on Monday? Or is everyone worried about the PSCTs? Yeah. Yes. Come on, Gaffa, scale us out. You're the military historian, I thought. It should be right up your alley, man. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. <clears throat> we struck out here. Abdul will bail us out again. Not, not Berber. It's close. Close. They went. Barbary. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it derives from the Berber culture that's prevalent throughout North Africa. Yes. Okay. Again, historically speaking. What an example here for you of precedence. American military personnel sent to North Africa, sent to close to the Middle East, where, of course, our military has been heavily involved. One of Jefferson's most stout in international crises was the fact that, that these states in North Africa, the Barbary states, pirates from those that region were attacking American ships where they were trying to trade in what body of water? Question. The Mediterranean Sea. Yes, North Africa, the Mediterranean Sea. So our vessels, our merchant ships. And if you think about, if you think about all the turmoil, our poor merchants had. Like that would be the worst job. If you had to go back in time, like the last job you'd want to be is a merchant in like the late 1700s, early 1800s. Because if you weren't being attacked by Barbary pirates. What have we talked about? It's already been going on with those with those sailors. Impressment. Impressment. Right. Impressment. And impressment had, was an ongoing issue still because of the failure of Jay's treaty. So what was going on was these these pirates, not like the, you know, not of the uh, the Jack Sparrow kind of pirate, the pirates of the Caribbean, and these were more like the Somali pirates that were in the news. Uh, not that long ago, attacking cargo ships and demanding ransom for the ship captains. Uh, these were these were aggressive uh, groups that were attacking American ships, and it wasn't just American ships, of course; it was European ships as well. But to give you a sense of where we're at, uh, so we got most of North Africa here, including Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. These were all actually part of the Ottoman Empire, but they, they did operate independently <coughs> at times. And the Americans were getting attacked while trying to establish trade routes overseas. So this begs the question, you know, if you're Thomas Jefferson, what do you do here? What do you do? I mean, for Thomas Jefferson, I mean, how are you going to respond to this? We saw how George Washington responded to impressment. He sent John Jay to try to negotiate a treaty, and it failed. But what do you do if you're Jefferson? Christiana? Make a navy. Ah, oh, well, but there already is a navy, because that started under who? Adams. Adams. All right, the Department of the Navy was created due to the XYZ affair and the quasi-war with France. So Jefferson has something in his arsenal, though, as president and commander-in-chief that George Washington did not which is a Navy. So what do you, what do you, knowing that, Christian, how does that change your, your thought? Would you deploy the Navy or just? Have like an escort for the Navy? Okay, provide some sort of military escort. That's one option, I suppose. 
I think the main thing to, to, to recognize here again is the fact that there is a Navy. This is at his disposal, something no president prior to him had had to utilize to support those merchants. You wanted to, you sure? Sash, could you just like attack them back? Would Order you, the Navy to yeah, attack? Because, like since you have the Navy now, like okay. you have okay. defenseless merchants fighting against like armed pirates. Right, have, like, okay, so that's one option, just attack. Forget the, the envoy, escort, just attack. Now, these are options, right? And as commander in chief, these are the hard decisions presidents have to make. But what would have George Washington done in this situation? Based on that farewell address, I, I say you're often responsible for. Um, Ruth, what would Washington have said here? Mm, he wouldn't have gone to the world peace. Like he, he wouldn't have tried to set an aid maybe. That would have made it messier. Okay, it would have made it, well, certainly anytime you, you involve, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, military presence outside your territory, it could get messy. Devani? I mean, he would have just sucked it up and dealt with it. Sucked it up and dealt with it? Maybe. Take off his glasses, <laughs> just say to the Barbary pirates, I come here with the speech, so I'm going to take off my glasses. <laughs> you want to follow up? Yeah. He would try to sound like a treaty, because that's what he did with the British, which is the treaty. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I mean, again, yeah, we're speculating here. Gathis? Probably just say trade somewhere else and not bother wasting time with okay. useless. Find different trade routes. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it's useless because well, certainly I mean, the Mediterranean. If you're wasting your time trying to get away from the pirates and nothing's working, why would you continue trading there? You know? I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Look, again, I don't want to get too deep in the, in the speculation business, but what I want to make clear to you guys and everybody watching at home is that for the first time now, a president has a navy at his disposal. And that's crucial because Jefferson will exert executive power and authorize the Navy to attack and fight back against the pirates. He did not ask Congress to go to war. There was no declaration of war here. As commander in chief, however, Thomas Jefferson used that power bestowed upon him in the vesting clause of the Constitution. He refused to negotiate with, with the, the pirates and instead, that Navy goes steamrolling towards the Mediterranean. Here's a quote from Jefferson. I'm not sure if people can see this at home, so I'll read it out loud. Millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. That was Thomas Jefferson's opinion on how to handle this, this quite tense situation. And ultimately, the United States Navy was able to muscle itself into the Mediterranean, blockaded the city of Tripoli, which is one of the main trade ports in Libya. And our ships were able to continue their, their trade. The pirates backed down. Well, pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. You know, to look at in terms of just Historical precedents. What? Oh, Ishan has breath mints. Oh, would you like one? Okay. I'd like one. Ask Ishan. <laughs> yes, right. So just to clarify, you didn't like pay anything to like Correct. Correct. Jefferson refused to negotiate. Okay, because, like, I don't know, I, because in the book it says that, like, um, they paid a bribe to protect the ships because at first they ordered the Navy to attack, but then um, Jefferson realized that he wanted to avoid a war that would increase the national debt, so they agreed on, like, paying. They paid less, according to the article. They paid, they paid much less for a last tribute on the side. Yeah. The idea, the conflicting, I think where we're getting a little conflicting, what I'm, what I'm trying to overemphasize, and this is just, again, to make sure the point sticks, is that a strong show of force was demonstrated here by the president, Jefferson. Saying the military was a strong symbol of power. And for a nation that is still um, less than 20 years old, it was a way for the United States to kind of flex its muscles a bit. You're right, they paid much, much less than the pirates were demanding, but that was only after they were and blockade and proved that the American Navy could hold its own.
But thank you. See, that's that's what I like. I, I appreciate when you guys ask those follow-up questions because if you don't ask that question, then it gets confusing when you're trying to backtrack. Now, you would never in an AP question get something that super specific. Never. They would never ask you like the, the minute details. But could this, in a short answer, be utilized to show how presidents have exerted their roles as commander-in-chief? Absolutely. You could tie this back in to how Jefferson was one of the first presidents to use the Constitution and his role as commander-in-chief. And in this case, I guess he really was acting like a strict interpreter. Because that power is in the Constitution. The loudest door ever. Loudest door. <sighs> yes? Like, it's kind of, like, specific. I'm not sure if you want to like, be able to get, like, a good answer. But, like, since, like, the, the U.S. Navy is, like, brand new and they just created it, how are they able to defeat pirates who must have been, like, doing this for, like, years and years? Well, remember, I mean, <clears throat> the Americans, um, again, I know we haven't talked about the Industrial Revolution, but this is at the time when our industry was really starting to kick in gear. And, again, we had people with experience as well, um, you know, sailors and 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 merchants and whatnot. But it is a fascinating study that I'm sure there's got to be, like there's, in fact, yeah, there was a book I gave. The Mayflower. No. <laughs> no, I have to ask, because I, I gave, there was a book that I gave last uh, Christmas to um, my wife's um, aunt's husband. And uh, it was uh, it was on the Barbary Wars. I'll have to ask you how much detail it went into. I did, though, get clarification on, on your... And it wasn't until 1801 that the Dem reps took over the House. Okay. So the Federalists had enough of uh, seats still in the Senate to confirm those judges. Josh had asked in fifth hour yesterday, how could John Marshall and so many Federalist judges be approved, even though the Dem reps had, had been taking over seats in Congress and obviously Jefferson as the president? But when I looked it up in 1800, there were still enough seats that the Federalists had in the Senate. So I was just wanted to follow up to you. All right, last question on the Barbary states, and I want to move. It's on there. Okay. Oh, oh so um, wasn't there a, a Democrat president that had to nominate the... Adams nominated them in 1800. Because remember, you always, the election's in the even years. The president doesn't start for the odd years. So Jefferson would in 1801. So he, Adams nominated them right before he left office. The Midnight Judges scandal. Yeah, we covered that yesterday. Yeah. All right. Now, look, Jefferson is not off the hook. He's got more trouble brewing. And surprise, surprise, it's going to have to do with impressment. It's going to have to do with impressment. Not good. I mean, I guess if there's one thing you guys have learned over the last month, it's that impressment is like one of the most central issues in early American history. I mean, it's really insane <coughs> how frequently this becomes a problem. Now, much of the issues that Jefferson was facing outside of the Mediterranean internationally had to do with Napoleon. Because even though Napoleon and the United States worked out the deal and the arrangement for the... Uh, Louisiana Purchase, Napoleon was threatening all economies in Europe by setting up the, the blockade as part of his continental system. Did you guys learn about that last year, the continental system? Yeah. Um. <laughs> by blockading, especially Britain, the French Navy became super aggressive in patrolling the North Atlantic and waters near Europe. And that was bad for American business. That was bad for American merchants. So check this figure out here. The British Navy, between the British Navy and along with the French, I want to include that Navy, that, that, that these figures include the French. With everything going on in the wars, Napoleonic Wars, it's estimated by historians that the United States lost somewhere between eight and 12,000 sailors due to impressment. I'm sorry, eight, uh, around 8,000 sailors due to impressment in this early first decade of the 19th century. 8,000 sailors are were believed to be impressed. 
And remember what that means. Your ship is boarded, you're more or less kidnapped, coerced, and you were forced into service, impressed into service for now a foreign country. And there's no help coming. There's no help coming in that case. Shivanki, can you uh, just do a little shimmy on the mouse or harshini so that way it doesn't like, the disc doesn't shut off? All right, we should be good. Hopefully. It'd be funny if this is not recording. <laughs> <laughs> so, Everything with everything that's going on in Europe, once again, it's that same age old, same age old theme I've been reiterating since we started the year. What happens in Europe directly affects America. It is remaining to be true because all the Napoleonic Wars, the spillover, is increased turmoil on the high seas. You got French, you got British navies engaging in conflict, and the Americans, our merchant ships and vessels are right smack in the middle of this, this storm. And consequently, more and more Americans continue to become impressed. So how does Jefferson play this one out? How does he play this one out? He, we saw how he did it with the pirates, but this is different than North African pirates. We're talking about France and Britain. So how does Jefferson play this one out? Let's make sure this is recording. <laughs> I do a... I could take a break and you can just teach if you want. No. Say that one more time. Correct. Jefferson was able to convince Congress to pass legislation to ban all trade with Europe. The impressment issue was growing so steadily that Jefferson and James Madison, who was our Secretary of State, so these were his, this is his kind of territory here with foreign affairs. Together, Madison and Jefferson, the old buddies that went back to the Constitutional uh, you know, era and the, the Revolution, and then of course the uh, protests and the stamp of uh, the, the, the Alien and Sedition Acts, T. Jeff and J. Mad come up with a plan to try to mitigate the growing crisis of impressment. And what they decide to do is completely shut down, for a brief period of time, American ships from exiting our waters. Yes? Um, they just completely stop all trade, or is this when they go and knock down the time of trade? Man, is that later? That's about 30 years later. Isn't that like Matthew Perry and like isolationism? That's, we're, we're talking about the 1930s, 1940s, 19, I'm sorry, 1840s and 1850s when Matthew Perry arrived in Japan. No, we're not, we're not going to Asia here. Japan is isolated under the uh, Tokugawa shogunate still. So if we can't trade with Europe, who are we trading with? Well, good question. Good question. But before we get to Tyler's uh, question, does anybody remember, aside from Abdullah, the name of the legislation? You gotta know this. This is a big piece of legislation to know. <clears throat> Ashton? What? The Embargo Act, correct. The Embargo Act. Oh, I forgot to mention one of our, our naval ships was inadvertently sank by a British warship. Uh, that added to the turmoil, so I, I forgot that as part of the narrative. I was getting ahead of myself. But yes, the Embargo Act of 1807 which was passed right after one of our warships was, was hit by, by a British ship. To avoid all-out war in this era, Jefferson sanctioned American ships from, from trading abroad. That all, or just yeah, completely. So not just Europe? Correct. Um, so yeah, just Europe. They, they, banned, we, they banned trade with, with Europe. So who could they trade with, Tyler? Well, you've got Africa, Africa, Asia. China. No, Asia was not available. No, the oh. Chinese were not trading with the Americans at this point. Mostly the Caribbean. Mostly the Caribbean. I thought it said they also washed off with any European like, territories too. Yeah. So unless they were, yeah. 
and there weren't really too many independent islands, so it was pretty limited in what they could trade with the Caribbean. Because most of the Caribbean was still under European control. And Canada was as well, so that's off limits too. Canada's not independent yet for another century. Uh, is, look, I mean, you're seeing the ramifications of this. I mean, this could you imagine today completely shutting off trade with a certain country, how that would cripple? China. 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 Taiwan. North Korea. North Korea. <laughs> Venezuela. <laughs> and here's the statistic. I, I pulled this from the, from the textbook. Our exports, um, you know, after you know, this legislation sets in, uh, plunged from $108 million in profit to $22 million. This was a crippling economic blow to our ability to export goods. And, I guess, conversely, import as well. And look, there's always ways around it. We've talked about smugglers in the American Revolution, the protest era. I mentioned how there were you know, you know, smugglers going to Bermuda during the Revolutionary War. I mean, there's ways around this. But the official government policy was nobody in, nobody out. And this was a way to mitigate crisis, to mitigate war. Now, is that going above and beyond the Constitution? Can Congress shut down trade like that? Is that going above and beyond? We've been talking about this, this whole constitutional you know, seesaw battle here. Be cheesy, what do you think? They do have the power to regulate international trade. This is probably just an extreme, but to technically their form of that. You're right. Congress has the power to regulate trade. And that also comes from the General Welfare Clause in, in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. That Congress will, will, can regulate trade and provide for the general welfare. And in this case, Madison, Congress, and Jefferson argued that the general welfare was worth the economic loss. But this did have a crippling effect, no doubt, on our economy for a brief period of time. Eventually, the act would be lifted. I mean, this does not, this not last like for, you know, for decades here, but eventually it would be lifted. But again, it just kind of contributes to this idea. If you think about how each president has handled these crises, Washington, totally neutral. We'll claim our neutrality, stay out of things. You know, Adams had the whole mix up with France and the Quasi War, but Jefferson is really now putting his foot down on certain issues. So you got the Barbary states. And now you've got the Embargo Act as ways of dealing with these, these, these situations. But, uh, and I, think, I know I didn't show you the election results in 1804. Uh, Jefferson would fall in line with George Washington's two-term tradition. And in 1808, a new Democratic Republican candidate would emerge, and that would be who? Who's going to emerge and take up the Democrat-Republican uh, dynasty. Meta, remember? Um, James Madison. Madison, right. If you look at presidents in American history and you want to try to figure out like where they come from, take a look early on at Secretary of State. That was long, and you'll see as we as we keep going with this. Traditionally, the Secretary of State is like the stepping stone to the presidency. Back then, a lot of presidents had previously served as Secretary of State. And so Madison, Madison's going to run against three candidates. Charles Pinckney was the candidate for the Federalist Party. And then George Clinton was an independent Democrat Republican. He ran as like a third party. Thing. The Dem reps obviously gave the nomination to Madison, but Clinton ran on his own. Yes? Well, yeah, it took it six is, from New York. Is, yeah, I, the, the, the parties weren't too concerned because Madison had a strong stranglehold on the, on the, was the nomination. Yes, Clinton was from New York, yes. No relation to, to Bill and Hillary. And he, like, does he legislate you like, advocate for like, the freedom of states? An abolitionist? Yeah. yeah. I believe so. He also um, was, I uh, forget what his job was, but he... Something the Constitution, like, yeah, yep. Yeah. And he also served with George. He also was, was with Washington as well. He was part of Washington's government as well. What do you notice about the regional breakdown here? Obviously, the Dem Rep influence is growing. That, that's a given. 
But what do you know about the regional breakdown between the parties now? Give me like a statement about regionalism here. What's coastal? The Federalists. Uh, okay, yeah, the Federalists seem to have the majority of their, their, their states left are on, on the northeast coast. And what, what region do we refer to this as, Christopher? I got you. Christopher? <clears throat> Tom Brady plays for me. I don't think that's going to help. Because I don't like Tom Brady references in my class. <laughs> so now you're just agitating me. Stephen Gostowski. <laughs> Chris. New England. New England. The Federalist stronghold moving forward. You're going to notice this come up when we talk about the War of 1812 tomorrow. The Federalist stronghold now had really, outside of some electoral votes in New England, uh, North Carolina, and Delaware. New England's the base of operation, and it's now really becoming a fledging operation. The Federalist Party is, is going to really all but dissipate from future presidential pol politics. And this is now starting to become a clear-cut Dem Rep dynasty. But Madison will take over the presidency in 1808, and he'll win again in 1812. And Madison's presidency is going to be defined primarily by two significant conflicts involving the U.S. military. Yes? Um, did the Democratic Republicans call themselves Democratic Republicans? Yes. Yes. I don't know if they said, yo, what up, Dem rep? I don't know if they like, were that. Hey, you know, DR. DR, I don't know. But... Or they often refer to themselves as Republicans. You'll see that they refer to themselves a lot as like Republicans. Like Shouting random things. Like D R D, like. <laughs> <laughs> like okay. All right. Hey, Sachin, if it helps you, remember it. So like you, I, you get a five on your AP, and I get a two hundred dollar bonus. Good. Great. I'm happy. Good. All right. Um. So let's um, let's kind of break there for today. Uh, we still got a few minutes left. I want to talk about something else. We're looking at two conflicts tomorrow, and I can't assign homework tonight. It's the flip side thing, so you're off the hook again, right? But we're going to talk about two conflicts tomorrow that become central in Madison's presidency. One is going to be another Native American conflict <coughs> in the Northwest Territory. Surprise, surprise. And the other is going to be the second war with Great Britain, the War of 1812. So we'll have that all wrapped up tomorrow. I am going to turn off the camera, so thank you for watching at home. If anybody actually did watch at like, home. Like, subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>